Thank you guys for coming out to uh, AIGA's Design After Dark Lecture Series. Um, this is going to be a continuing series that we're going to do. Um, basically, it encompasses panels, roundtables, bringing in speakers from around the region. Um, and for this first one, we're going to be doing this small design business roundtable with a couple of experts here. But before we get into that, um, I, I do want to thank um, Jean Peterson from MetLife. She sponsored tonight's event. So I hope you're welcome. in my previous life was actually on the board of AIGA for a number of years, so I know what you do and how you do it. But for the last seven years or so, I've been a financial planner and a financial advisor. And while as a rule, well, you designers are always very creative, but sometimes you're not so good at managing your business. And this forum seemed a good way to mesh the two and for me to come in and introduce myself as a resource that you can use to help you achieve your financial goals. Because while great design is wonderful, you have to pay the bills, you have to protect yourself, you have to save for retirement, you have to do all of these other financial things to make yourself successful not only in your business but in your life. And I would like to be a resource for you. I have my cards over there. I'd love to set up meetings with you one-on-one, -on -one, Get put you on my mailing list if you hand me your business cards. So I'd love to be a resource, but we'll let all of these people take over. I just wanted to say hi and welcome and thank you so much. So like I said, uh, tonight's talk that we're going to be doing is small design businesses, um, the fundamentals. Um, I'm Vera Rossetti. Uh, if you guys haven't met me, please let's meet. I'm the president of the AIGA Jacksonville chapter. Uh, and let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to have everyone on the panel introduce themselves. And as they said earlier, it's because I didn't want to memorize the long list of everything that they've done. <laughs> so I'm going to go over here on this side. And we'll start with Miss Jill Applegate. OK. I'm Jill Applegate. The name of my company is Jill Applegate Design. And um, I've been doing design since 1977. And um, six years ago, um, I went out on my own. I just worked by myself. Thanks, Joe. Great. My name is Emily Rawich, and I am the owner of Studio Orange Design. Um, I have been in the design industry for six years now. I just set up my LLC a year ago. Um, I've been working mornings uh, on my lunch break, evenings and weekends, and just as of Monday, I went to full time. So um, just made a huge transition. It's been a year in the making. I'm Michelle Chance Sangbaum, and I uh, help businesses figure out how this web stuff works and figure out ways that they can leverage it for their business. And most recently, I'm working with clients who are business owners who don't, know, don't have enough money to market their business, but they have, or I should say they have more time than money to market their business. And so we're helping them figure out ways that they can actually implement affordable marketing strategies online and offline to actually increase their sales. My name is Kate Rowe. I'm a lawyer at uh, Smith Gambrell and Russell downtown. I'm an intellectual property and technology lawyer. Um, I uh, have had a variety of different kinds of careers. I was an in-house lawyer at Random House in New York for five years and um, represented the Society of Illustrators in New York and the Graphic Artists Guild. And down here, teach art law at the New York State uh, Law School next door um, every other year. So I love what I do. I'm Mary Harvey. I'm the founder and owner of Agency a la carte, which most of you know is a staffing and recruiting firm. We specialize just in advertising, marketing, and public relations. If you're interested in freelancing and you'd like to register with us, just go to agencyalacarte.com and upload. And I have to tell you guys, because this is different, I need a Word document or text version of your resume, because that will populate the database and put the right keywords in my database so that I can find you when I go to hunt for you. Uh, so you can also attach a PDF so that I can see how beautiful and creative it is. But I need a text document to work with my database. Cool. So thank you guys for participating in this 
round table discussion. Um, the format for tonight, um, I want to keep this pretty light and conversational. Um, we had asked that you guys, if you have questions, you know, uh, go ahead and raise your hands. Um, we're going to keep this free flowing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start first off to see how many people in the room are like students. Just a show of hands. And how many of you guys are like small business owners? And now how many of you are looking to start your own thing or just be independent? Cool. So, good show of hands. Um, I guess one of the first things, I, I personally am starting out on my own. Um, I've created a couple of businesses, but I've always had a business partner with me. Um, so delving into this field is definitely a new kind of thing. And, and one of my first things that I'd love to know is, how do you start? Um, name, you know, work with the city, work with the state. How do you how do you start off becoming your own business entity? That, that's a question to any of you guys. I would say one of the first best things you can do is check out the Chamber of Commerce and the University of North Florida. Both have small business centers. The Chamber of Commerce also has a women's business center. Um, both offer all kinds of classes, all kinds of tutoring and mentoring uh, in starting a small business. They have things about the legal ramifications, about the financial ramifications. They can help you apply for an SBA loan if you want. Um, not that I suggest you apply for any kind of loan, but uh, they can help you. Uh, way through all of that. UNF has a small business development center and the chamber downtown. Those are two places I have mm -hmm. well, I'm curious like with Emily because you know, you, you're pretty much the, the newest person on the panel to do this yeah. as well. You know, what, what steps then do you I take? I think that to? the biggest thing is to immerse yourself in knowledge and research. Um, I would say definitely, you know, start off, you know, once you know you want to do it, you know, meet with a lawyer, find an accountant, find a financial advisor, and write a business plan. Um, we are in the business world. Um, it's one thing to have a great idea. It's another thing to write that whole idea out for like a three to five year plan and think through it. Um, I really think you have to, to treat it like a, a true business. Just because we're in the creative world doesn't mean we can be casual about our, our business strategy. So I think that's the best advice I can give you is, is to write a business plan. Mm -hmm. uh, Jill, how did you start out? Um, well, I was not nearly as organized as anyone here. <laughs> uh, Which is really good because it's like, you know, I myself, again, it, it, I'm on the creative side and it's like, how do you, how do you work this? business of design now, it's, it's a whole new mind element that you have to learn because you really have to be strict to... Yeah, I'm rare. I'm kind of 50-50 <laughs> with creativity and MC yeah. business side. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, really, you know, really, I just I just started working. Actually, I was laid off in 2003, and so, I, you know, I just sort of started doing work for people, and I just got out of, got in my spare bedroom, which I'm still doing today. And um, so I, I never, I don't have an LLC. I didn't do anything, you know, with legal. I did get an occupational license, although I, I understand you don't even have to do that. Um, so um, I just started doing the work. And, and actually, I'm an extremely organized person. But I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't consult a financial plan. I didn't go to a lawyer. I didn't do, I didn't do anything. I just started working. You know, so. It's probably different if you want to have an office or, oh, David. I was just going to say, I know Jill personally. I've worked with her for several years, and she's a creative person. She is very organized. <laughs> Thank you, David. She is, more than the average. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was curious to, to hear, like. It's funny, because, you know, as a lawyer, I would, I would think I'd say, go see a lawyer first. But actually, that's not what I would say. I would say, go see an accountant. Mm -hmm. Really, because I find most of my the small businesses that I advise get in trouble with the money. And it's not, you know, just even paying employees properly is like one of the first things that go wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And then that accountant can actually advise you on many aspects of the tax and how to, what, what obligations you have. And that may actually end up to helping you decide, well, do I want to form an entity? Do I want right. to just do my thing as a sole proprietor at this point? Um, I mean, because obviously as a lawyer, we're gonna, the lawyers always think, oh gosh, liability. How do you protect yourself from liability? But you don't want that to sort of run the show. That's obviously an important issue. I do think that they get into trouble, lots of businesses, very quickly 
and uh, on things that a good accountant who just starts you out right and actually helps you, you know, do your books properly can keep you out of trouble. Do any of you, uh, you mentioned also, Michelle, that you've got your own small business. Um, Bookkeeping-wise, has any of you done this yourself, or do you recommend going and find someone to take care of that on its own? Find another person to do it who's smart and you can work with and uh -huh. won't steal your money. And uh, because you you can't, this is something I this is my personal opinion. Other people may feel differently. I am lousy at managing that part. I am really great at what I do know how to do, but I just want to spend the money. I don't really want to track it. I don't really want to, you know, collect from customers. It's funny, we were talking just before we got started. I just, I just, start, I just tried out um, FreshBooks today, which is much easier to use and works more with creative people, I think, than QuickBooks. And if you only have three clients, it's free, free commercial for FreshBooks. But, um, and this is an accounting? And it's, an, it's an online accounting web app. Super simple, super easy. And I realized today that I had $2,700 in outstanding collections that I didn't know about. And so I went, well, I should be paying attention to this. And, and so, but if I was working with a, with a bookkeeper, I would have, here's our bills for the month, here's what we're doing. So. Right, you get onto a schedule on those, and that's right. kind of like what you need to keep, you know, your business strict and, and in order. Yeah, and, and even before I had a business, I have another business, and before that, I would say it was the very first mistake that we made, mm -hmm. was not starting out with an appropriate accounting guidance from the very beginning. And and you think it's, it's, how does it get out of control? But it gets out of control very quickly, especially if you start getting busy and you're working. And all of a sudden it becomes very unimportant, these envelopes that come in, right, that things have to be done for. That's, that's, how, that's how my house is now, in a way. <laughs> I'm still learning. But um, so with the, with the accounting kind of side, um, I, I was just thinking about how, how much should you, uh, um, how much should you be like keeping into your own account, or like how how organized you have to be when you first start out, like starting out your own separate business account? And checking like a right, account. Exactly. Very, 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 very from the very beginning. Credit yeah. cards. Everything has no credit cards, it. but you know. I'm, I'm with Mary, no credit cards. Uh, <laughs> just very quickly, I didn't do that. I'm what's called an accidental entrepreneur, kind of like Jill. I just started working from home, and this agency a la carte grew up around me. And I had a really bad bookkeeper for about five years, and I know he was bad because I got audited by the IRS, and that's a very long story. That's but one story. thing I can tell you is that I had two American Express cards, one in the business name and one in my personal name. But I didn't always pay close attention to which one I was using. If I was at Barnes & Noble and I wanted some books and I only had my business American Express, I went ahead and bought them and just called them research stuff. So I didn't ever worry too much about it. They took three years of records for two American Express accounts and did a spreadsheet on every penny I spent and classified it as either business or personal. That's how seriously they take it. How big were you at the time when uh, I was billing a couple of million okay. when I got audited. So, and I was audited for three years for my personal and my business and my husband's business. He owned his own business too. It was a mess. So I would always, I, I believe what Kate says 100%. The accountant, the bookkeeper, the person that helps you handle your money is the single most important person you'll know. And I think too you have to find the right accountant. Like I think I met with five people until I found someone that was the right man. For me, exactly. I mean, you have to feel really comfortable with them. Um, I use QuickBooks actually, and I do my monthly bookkeeping. But my accountant double checks me around tax time. She looks through everything and right. makes sure yes. I haven't missed stuff. So I kind of do most of the bookkeeping, but I have an accountant that I work with four times a year. Um, but it's very important to keep it separate from yeah. your personal, even if you work as a sole proprietor and report your earnings to your social security number. It's just a very important thing. Okay, well, I was going to say, it, it may actually, at the, at, after discussing the accountant stuff, it does actually build in the fact you might set up a separate entity. Um, mm -hmm. Because you, you, want, you may want to end up doing that because you're trying to protect yourself from personal liability. And, and so the fact that you do set up a separate entity helps you protect your home and things like that and your fabulous jewels and all that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> that um, and yet, uh, and, and actually psychologically, it can help you keep these things distinct you know there is just no way that you should you know, that it'll be clear you know this is the company car this company credit card is not my home and then you have these distinctions and uh, and, and in your mind keep them separate and also in your behavior and in your billings and 
all kinds of things like that. And the official term, by the way, because I found this out the hard way, is called co-mingling. <laughs> so that you know, you don't want to be co-mingling, just so you know. I've had to that a lot. That. <laughs> I well, I think when you're, when you're first starting out, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to, you know, be so formal. I mean, it's, it's great, but, you know, I mean, you just start working and then you start figuring out this stuff. I mean, like, for Is this from experience? Really? Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> I mean, you don't want to do anything illegal, but I, I think, like, I don't use QuickBooks or anything like that. I write my invoices by hand. Like, but I don't have employees. I don't. I don't have to pay social security for employees or anything like that. I work by myself, so it's it's really easy for me to keep track, you know. And I do have an account, but I didn't go to him first. I just <laughs> I just started working and I kept track of everything. Well, I mean, it's really good that we have both you and Emily yeah. on here because there, there's like almost two different dynamics as well. Besides, I think the, you have to find what works for you. Exactly. That's what exactly. I don't think there's no right or wrong. It's just. You know, what you're comfortable with. And what the RSS is. But there is that problem that you can write wrong IRS. Especially when you work from home, because you, you do have to make sure, because they can come in and audit your, your or even mm -hmm. make sure that your office space truly is your office space. I've had friends have that happen to them. Michael, so how do you know if you're going to make an, uh, an IMC, an LLC? How just Why would you choose one over the other? I knew you'd ask me that question. I was going to ask you Yeah, well, I'm not actually a corporate lawyer, but I went next door to my colleague in my law office. Remind me, you know, <laughs> the, all the differences. Okay, so there's a C Corp, there's an S Corp, LLC. So I'm going to give you just the 101, and I forgive you that I don't know more than that because I, I, it's just not my area. But C Corp, you would set up, and the C Corp, you have double tax, right? The company pays tax, and the people who receive the money, you know, you, for example, if you get the money for the corporation, pay tax. So that's not a very common thing for you, want, for you to want to do. S Corp, the money flows through, you pay tax only upon receiving it. LLC, same thing. There are some distinctions, and uh, LLC is more flexible in some ways in terms of who can own shares of the company. Other entities can own shares of the company. Other corporations can own shares of the company. That's not the case with an S Corp. S course has a lot of benefits in that it's there's a lot of uh, the the, um, the the law governing those kinds of corporations is very well developed and very laid out and so it's easy to understand you know what the responsibilities of officers are things like that LLC is much more flexible and you might have to make some more decisions uh, in terms of governing it draft more bylaws things like that to really understand what your options are what are you doing. but the, all three of them provide you main thing that you want, which is protection from personal liability if you maintain them properly. The bad thing about LLCs about that point is that sometimes it's a little uh, unclear what you have to do to actually maintain that uh, protection from personal liability. You don't want someone to so-called pierce the corporate veil, which means you didn't behave like an LLC properly, you didn't behave like a corporation, so there's, you, know, you didn't protect your personal assets. Um, corporations, as I said, have the, the rules are pretty easy to follow. Um, they, they, they make sense. They're laid out. LLC, it, again, it's a little more flexible, but both would work totally fine if you, you know, operate them properly. So uh, LLC is more flexible in terms of who could own it, um, and uh, S -Corp, but both have the benefits of the tax flow through, the S and the LLC. Anything different <laughs> than purchasing these? Acquiring. Oh, somebody acquiring. else buying you or something? <coughs> no, 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 no. Starting one up. Right. Starting one up. Is there is what? There, is there a difference in the amount that you pay to make an S Corp or an LLC? I don't know that. I, I think, think there was, probably is. I think it was like a two hundred dollar difference. Actually, I think the LLC was a little bit more. Difference. Well, it should be more because there's yeah. more decisions that you have to make. I'm sure I have not done this going online and you know tried to form one of these things automatically. When I when I when my clients come in the office and do them, I hand them over to the corporate people and they sit down and make this long list that people fill out in terms of making decisions. Uh, and with the corporation, with the with the S corps, all, mo the, most of the standard things kick in. This is why I'm saying it's a lot. The LLC can be more flexible, but so I don't think it's a huge difference in terms of formation at all. It's uh, less than a hundred dollars to do either. I mean, to, you process it yourself, you write your own article from corporation, and it's less than $100. Laura? So what kind of dollars are we talking about in this way that you need to know beforehand, setting up your business in terms of contacting a lawyer and an attorney or an accountant? Yeah, you need capital. Yeah. Yes. So yes. what kind of capital are we talking about to begin with? 
Well, first of all, I think you should be able to shop around for an accountant and a lawyer without spending any money. Mm -hmm. And to Emily's point, you should find, it's, it's kind of like looking for a doctor. You find somebody you really have a good rapport with who understands sort of, you gets what you're about. Um, so it's basically on that hourly no, yes. no, I mean, it's not really you can shop around without lawyers. You can interview them without being charged. charged. What? I said, you can interview them without them charging. Oh, them. yeah, in some Always. instances, yeah. Um, but let me say that I think that, like, the Small Business Administration, other places like that might be the, the best bet if you, because I think there are a lot of workshops that, that are, are where, you know, I actually go volunteer in places like that and sit down with groups of people and say, okay, what's, let's work, you know, because that's pe people, lawyers do do pro bono stuff. It's not all, you know, the, the jazzy, exciting pro bono and stuff like that. You have to give on the workshop. So if you don't have a lot of money and you can't convince a lawyer, which, you know, sometimes it's very easy to convince a lawyer to say, I have this great, I need a little help, you know, and then they'll do it without charging you if you're, or they'll, they'll, they'll say I'll do it for a flat fee because they want you as a long-term client. That's my philosophy about when you have, you know, young artists and designers and, and small companies. You're, you don't really want someone who's going to walk in there and work out and then, it's not fun. What you want are clients that you can help grow, build, draft their their standard agreements so they understand, that they understand. You know, you, it's very exciting when you have a client that really wants to understand every word in their own standard agreement, which is really you should. And so it's so fun to set those things up. But, you know, their lawyers are, there's a lot of lawyers who, you know, they can only really take multi million dollar clients given the things that happen. So, uh, you know, lawyers, all, all, most lawyers will, if you call them up and you want a consultation, if they have an interest in helping small businesses and many of them just can't or don't want to, they should meet for you without charging and tell you what their charges are. And it, it runs the gamut. It completely runs the gamut. It could be from 100 bucks an hour to $800 an hour to flat fees. So as a student, should you go out and try to find this stuff, or should you wait until you maybe graduate and you start building more capital as freelancing? What would you suggest as a student, just right out the gate, try to fund this maybe on student loans, or try to pay that back later in life, or try to just let it happen? But so, I would not want the legal side of this to run, you know, it's too important that you grow creatively and have there's, fun. No, yeah, say, there's like, there's something to say about is a low part of this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you, you need to get out and try things out for a little bit and then as you start to get a little bit more serious then start to you know invest in that uh, for your business moving right. forward. I would really recommend working for somebody yeah. for a while for us really. <clears throat> Again experience I think plays a key role. I'd like to go back one real quick back to um, the, the idea of the, the entity. Um, I'm curious about how both Emily and Jill you, um, Jill, I don't know if you're I'm, I'm actually, a, I'm a sole proprietor. Okay. okay and then, so I haven't done the LLC. I have an LLC, and the main reason for that was to protect my assets. That mm -hmm. means that if for some odd reason in the future a client sues me, they're suing Studio Orange, not Emily. And I just wanted to set up that legal protection. Um, that was the main reason mm -hmm. that I did that. And so, Jill, you said you're a sole proprietor? Sole proprietor, and that doesn't cost anything to do. And basically, what happens um, when a client um, pays me initially, I have to give it, so like, like a W9, I have to give my social security number. Okay, so um, and that's it. You know, and yes, they could sue me. I've never had any problem. Um, <laughs> you know, you know I, I, thought about, I thought about getting an LLC, just, you know, for that reason, for that very reason. But, um, but anyway, I've, I've been maybe lucky so far. But, you know, the thing is you can get started that way and then, and then change later. Yeah, I did some freelance work before I set this up. I really didn't set this up until I knew that I was really serious about it. So this whole time that we've been talking now as well, we, we haven't even delved into the design aspect of some of these things. We, we've just talked about setting it up. Before we move on, do you guys have any more questions about setting up a business? Well, I think y'all left out an important aspect. Is somebody, one of you two mentioned research, but you have to consider the name as you know and then research google the name and then you want to go to um, i forget what it's called but you have to secure your name before you can go any further when you think so let's talk about that a little bit um jill you're under jill applegate yes, design, and and design. If something Emily, about you use your name it, use your name you don't have to otherwise i think it's like fifty dollars 
for your name. Five years. Five years. Uh, well, uh, that's for state -wise. For for the state, you have to you you have to do your research and know whether or not um, you have a competing name. Now, I did hire a lawyer to do that for me, and I did pay because I I, I market outside of Jacksonville, and so I needed to be sure that the logo that I was designing for my corporation and the name of my corporation, because this was serious. I had people throwing money at me, which was beautiful. Um, I love when that happens. Um, but I needed to make sure that I wasn't going to end up in three years because I went to the lawyer and I started with the lawyer instead of the accountant and she said you need to make sure in three years when this thing is massively huge that somebody doesn't come along and go by the way Red Hawk Strategies have been our name for eight years and we're now taking your business away and so there is that to contend with when you, you but not that, that, that shouldn't stop you from starting but as far as the fictitious name there is a fictitious name registration in the state of Florida um, and yeah, I think you're right. I think it is every five years you have to renew it, and it's like $50 or maybe $75. You can do it online. Um, and that's just even as a sole proprietor, if you use a name other than your own, and you have to, you're supposed to, supposed to run it in a local paper so that it's like legal notice. So, uh, but it's not, it's not that complicated. But picking it matters, right? And you guys are in the branding and art and design business, and if it matters for your clients, it should also matter for you. So. You really want to? Yeah, it's it's the most asked question. Um, <laughs> that tells you something. How powerful and important the name is. I hope so. I really hope so. Um, my warrior color is red. I think red it, it, for me expresses an incredible power, and I also admire uh, red-shouldered hawks and hawks because the hawks have the ability to fly very high in the air, survey the entire landscape, see one little tiny mouse a mile away, dive in hit it and take care of business. And uh, I really feel that way about myself. I can take a look at the landscape of what we're working on in a marketing project or what's happening within a business's plan for, for their marketing or for their web and say, yeah, all these other things are happening, but this is the most important thing we need to be working on first. And that truly for me is where, and the totem for Hawk is about that. And that that's, it really does have a lot of meaning for me. It's so a great segue to like talking about marketing and promoting yourself now. So like picking that name has got to be uh, like a huge thing. Um, yes. I do about 80% of my work is trademark work, and so you are not alone in you know, thinking that the name is very, very important. And, and, you know, companies pick products and they pick strategies and slogans and things like that, and branding is, is really so critical. But it, it's a great thing in the sense that you are, in, in case you ever think of, se of selling your company, it's an important asset. In fact, it's sometimes the most important asset, which is a nice reason not to name it after your personal name because then you've got an issue about, you know, somebody buying your company while well, it's named this person, we sort of how do we deal with that and, and have some issues about it. where if it's named Red Hot Strategies, is that it? Red Hawk. Red Hawk. Yeah. See, I thought it was Red Hot. Oh Mary God. too. Yeah. I yeah. know. Well, I thought that for a long time. time. Mary owns a domain named Red Hot Strategies. Until she told me the thing about the hawk coming in for the mouse. Yeah, okay, and then I thought it was Red Hawk. I can't forget it, but it's her, it's her ex again. I ain't from around here, you know. Not either, but maybe that's a problem. Um, there are a whole bunch of different things you can do to actually protect a brand. If you're forming a company, you know, you don't have to do the fictitious name because that is the name of the company. If you form the name of the company, so you don't have to repeat it. But there's all kinds of things you can do. Yes, before you adopt it, first of all, I think when you pick the name, pick it. I think it's a really good idea to think about don't describe what you do. Because that's what everybody does. They pick names that describe what you do, you know, graphic design for automobile automobile industry, you know, auto graphic design. It's a perfectly natural human reaction to try to describe because you want to tell your customers what you're doing. But you should move away from that because those are very weak and very um, 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 uh, har very hard to protect brands. They're not even brands in many cases. Because they can't be protected. Not because they're weak in marketing, but because to protect the name itself. Is that what you're saying? Well, well think of linens and things. That's a classic example of a mark that actually was extremely weak when they adopted it. It sort of built some power after a while. Or things like Books A Million. Those are things that are brands that are probably really weak in the beginning, but built because they used it over time. But it takes a lot of money to take a weak mark like that and push it so much that consumers think, oh, they're not describing their stuff. That's the company, or that's the source. So instead of having to spend all that money, you pick a name. I mean, you're not going to necessarily pick a name, but Yahoo, Google, Amazon, the launch of Google and Yahoo are totally made up words, right? The most powerful brands in, uh, there are. Amazon is actually slightly less because it's an actual English language word, but it has nothing to do with the products or services. So, but they all end, end up being extremely powerful. 
So if you have an interest in trying to have a brand where the, the first time the customer hears it, they're going to remember it. That's some, sometimes the marketing goal of brands. And, yet, and you can always have slogans underneath them that tell, tell the customers what you do. You know, the best automobile design for the industry or whatever, you know, to, wh whatever it may be. So um, there's all different kinds of things you can do. You can just Google the heck out of it all over the place, try to figure out, at least in the United States, is anybody doing anything like this? It's a little, you know, that's one way to do it. If you came to me and you were a big company and you had plenty of money and you asked me what's the best way to search a brand, that we're, you know, we're launching a whole line of products, and we want, what I would do is I actually order full searches from a company and it comes in and they search company names, state registrations, federal registrations, and they, and, you know, uh, domain names out the wazoo, and they send me a fat report, and I go through it real quick, quick as I can, at my horrible hourly rate, and then I, you know, <laughs> call the client and say, here are the risks, this is what I found. There's nobody out there doing this with this or that with it, or, you know, anyway. And then the client, but then the question is, okay, the client hasn't started using it, what can they do? To sort of say, oh, I want it, I want it, I want to get it before somebody else. Because in the United States, trademark rights are earned based on use. It doesn't matter that, that you know, that, and that's totally different than European and foreign countries where who, the first to register has is everything. Um, and so people who have lots of marks in the United States get a lot, a lot of trouble in China because they never register in China. Then they register. But in the United States, use is key. So if you're just getting your business going and you can't use it beyond Florida or you can't outside of Jacksonville, what do you do? Well, the United States has this great structure where you can file an intent to use federal trademark application. And you file it, and then you can sit for a while and develop the whole business. And if, you, if it matures into a registration, which means if you uh, file it and it's based on the goods and services that you're actually going to use it with, and you actually have good use later, and you submit the use, and it becomes a registration, your constructive date of first use is the date that application was filed. So it could be even three years earlier. So that means once you get the registration and you find someone that you, your business grows, maybe you franchise it, or you, it just grows because you've got all these great customers all over the country, and you bump up against someone in Utah who's using the brand and they started doing it after you filed your application date, you say, stop. You can stop them if it's causing confusion. So it's actually not a very expensive process um, given the benefit. I think, in, in the long run that you get. And, you know, you don't have to pay a lawyer to do the search. I mean, obviously, someone like me, I would recommend that. But you can do searches as much as you want on your own. And as long as you feel comfortable, you can actually go on the USPTO.gov website, and there's an automatic and online process for filing a trademark application. Um, I'm going to tell you that I have never, never, I have rarely seen a trademark application done by a not a trademark lawyer that really is... Um, correct. Sometimes it, it's just it's it's just so ridiculous and it's so regulatory, but it is. And so you know that's one thing. If you have a if you wanted to spend a little money on a trademark lawyer and you didn't want them to do the search, you feel all comfortable. You might uh, that might be money well spent. Or go to a workshop where you have a real trademark lawyer who's walking you through the process so you get the tips. What is what is the price range for what you're talking? About? It's. Um, that to file a federal trademark application for one class of goods, so let's say it's design services, it's two hundred and seventy-five dollars. That's the filing that's fee. fee. That's a filing fee that you pay to the, the to the uh, federal government, and then it'll go in there, and you won't hear about it for a while, and then in about five months, you might have a, a something called an office action that says we don't like the way you've described the services or. Um, or, or they may even do the wrong thing, but the bad thing, which is um, they may find somebody else has already filed in front of you or has a registration and they say, you got a problem. But if you've done a really good search, and let me add to that, if you do a Google search, that's okay. But the one other search you should do if you're trying to rely on your own search, which I really do not recommend because this is such an important aspect of your business, is you can go on USPTO and they have search you know, mechanisms. Go in and you can search the name and search as many variables of it as you possibly can because, you know, somebody has red hawk, they might have red fox for design services or red hawks, and if you just put red, it should come up, but I'm just, you know, or they spelled it, you know, you know, red he hawk, yeah. uh, you know, some funny weird spelling, which people do a lot to try to get attention, and it might not pop up, so you have to try to do all these permutations, and that's why this formal search that I get is really great because they do all the permutations and I just have to look through it. They, 
they, I was really amazed. They found way more than I did. Mm -hmm. My book, I don't know how, my book that I got back was this thick. Yeah. And it was uh, single-sided sheets. And I'm just thinking of all the poor trees that had to be sacrificed for <laughs> this book. But I was amazed at, at what this, and it was, to me it was worth it to, to even though I, and I probably, I don't, I probably spent twelve or thirteen hundred dollars total to do that. That's um, just about right. Um, but frankly, my brand is protected now, and I don't have to worry about. It. And mostly, all the other Red Hawks are mostly manufacturing, so even better. So I'm completely kind of free to roam, free to fly. Did, uh, Jill or Emily, did you guys, have, or even Mary, did you guys go through any of these processes? I did do a similar thing with an intellectual mm -hmm. property lawyer for mine um, who helped set that up. I didn't do, I, I did more of the search on my own than paying for it, but I, I had them secure the name when I set up the LLC. I, I forget what I, I think I originally just wanted to be called Studio Orange, and because my client base is completely national, there was another company, slightly different industry, and I ended up just changing it to Studio Orange Design, or, or just all those different things, but I was really concerned, not just the local market, but on a national level, what else was out there. So now that you've, you've got your name secured, now it's, what, what are some of the, the tips and, and tricks of getting out there actually now? Spill it. <laughs> <laughs> this is anybody, yeah, really. I'd say networking. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's funny, as a designer, I think I spend most of my days in front of my computer, but the best way for me to get clients is not through the computer. It's more face-to-face -face and getting out there. And it's not just networking in the past six months, I mean, these are contacts I've had 10 years ago. Um, you know, it's getting to the point that people I went to high school and college with are moving up in, in the workforce as well. Um, so I just do a lot by any person I talk to, I'm so passionate about design, it comes up anyways and in every conversation in a sense of selling myself whether I need to or not. Um, but a lot of the way I'm getting work is just referrals. What about you, Jill? Same thing, same thing. And, and because I've worked in Jacksonville for so many years, I know a lot of people. <laughs> so, you know, I've worked with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so um, it, it really is just word of mouth. And, and, you know, networking too, more traditional networking, I guess, too, where you, you know, you can go to um, uh, other professional organizations like PRSA and get involved with in things they do. Get to, know, get to know professional groups that might hire for services. That's a really good way. So volunteer, volunteer to do some things for them. You know, and, and that, you know, that's a good way. Mary, you mentioned chamber mm -hmm. earlier. Um, yeah, you have to, the chamber here is very large, and you have to figure out where it works for you. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to, you would need to spend a little time giving some thought to what chamber functions are going to introduce you to the right people. Um, I find very often people I know who start freelancing, their first client is their last employer. That's not unusual at all. Probably Jill does work for all of her former employers. Because, <laughs> well, because no, but, no, I, but I, I did actually do some freelance for us Jennings. But, um, but very I often they didn't have a salary, so they cut that, but they still need to get the work done, and so they can pay you I call it out of another bucket of money. It's just not the payroll bucket, it's a project bucket. So very often um, you'll find that people you've worked for in the past, and again that's just networking. It's who you know, who, who you've worked with before, who knows you. Uh, if you can volunteer for um, AIGA has lots of uh, opportunities to volunteer and get to know other people. like. Jill said PRSA, FPRA, there's a new American Marketing Association chapter here that's taken off like a rocket. Michelle uh, is the head of an SEO meetup that meets once a month. It's a great, great group of people. She's got about, we, we started it, somebody else and Michelle started it uh, because nobody was real sure who was doing SEO and now a year later she's got like 30 people that come once a month. Regularly. Regularly. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing. amazing. Go on meetup, what is it, meetup.com? Meetup.com. And, you know, Google, or put in the search engine some words of things you're interested in. If you care about animals, volunteer for the Humane Society or No More Homeless Pets. If you care about kids, volunteer for the Children's Commission. 
you know, offer to do some artwork for some people for free. Let them see how good you are. Let them see that you're, you are cooperative about changing the blue to pink or whatever, you know, or not. Whatever you, however your personality works. Um, get, let people get to know you. And I'll put a plug in for AIGA here. Uh, thanks, Joe. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really, you know, AIGA is a, is a great organization. You know, they're not just local, they're national. I just think it's a great way to get to know, you know, all the other designers in town. I just can't say enough about it. I mean, I really got a lot out of it. I mean, I get a lot out of it. And um, so I just really, really, really recommend you get involved with AIGA. Get on the board, you know, do stuff, get involved, meet everybody. You'll probably end up working with them. Because a whole lot of what's going to come around for you is, did you do the work on time? Were you pleasant? Did you get along with everybody? So if that's a committee working with Beric on something, that's, you know, that's good. It doesn't necessarily have to be a logo design that you did. It may just be that you show up. Um, your being here tonight is a good great uh, indication, this great turnout for this discussion. I have to say, what impresses my clients more than my you know, concepts or conceptual thinking is the fact that I maintain clear communication, mm -hmm. that I email them promptly, that I, uh, when I, you know, <laughs> set a deadline, it's met. I can't tell you, that's what impresses people is that I'm professional, not just creative. That is a big part of it. I'd say design, mm -hmm. I mean, it's important, but, you know, it's just as important to, to be professional with your clients because they're not designers. They're, they're in the business world. So that's what they're looking for. And I think a lot of designers are perceived as being flaky, you know, <laughs> and I, you, you really, you know, and, and most of us really aren't, you know, I mean, we're real business people, you know, you know, so, you know, you just can't, you know, like show up the client and be all flaky and <laughs> lots of brooding colors and, you know, <laughs> so you want to be some business like. <laughs> there was a, there was a really good uh, note that we used while I was at Engine Works, and it was, it was get to the client before they can get to you. You know, satisfy all their needs before they give you the call to wonder what's going on. So that's a really good rule of thumb to, to take into account. It's like, and contact you, the client first. And if you've got bad news, get it over with. Right. It's yeah. going to come out <laughs> Just get it over with. Yeah. Um, and, and Eric, also, I just want to add, if you guys would like a couple of networking tips uh, for networking. So here, here's a really big surprise for a lot of people that I talk to. Networking events are not a place for you to go to have drinks with your friends. <laughs> no. No. See, I knew it would be a response. Uh, a networking event, you, you should know up front or have a really good idea who is going to be there and what three people that you're going to meet and connect with in that event. And, and I've even had some clients say, you're only allowed to take three business cards because it's not, it's not a marathon of passing out business cards. Hire me, hire me, hire me, hire me, hire me, right? Because you're not getting jobs that way, right? I usually jump when I do that in presentations. I'm sitting now, so that's the best I can do for you guys. But, um, so that, that's tip number one is you're not there to drink with your friends. You're there to meet new people. And you're there to listen to what they do. You're not there to spill your guts when you're commercial. You're trying to figure out if you're going to be able to get a date with this person right and so it's not all about you yet because you don't know whether or not that person can either give you business themselves refer lots of business to you or simply connect you with somebody who can do either of those things and so it's like you're you're getting a prospect for a date and you're going to listen and see if this is somebody I would like to take out on another date and and paying attention to that for them and if you're listening to them they actually are impressed and you're not waiting for your turn to talk and you ask leading questions. So hopefully that will be helpful for you guys. I always find that's interesting at networking events. You see somebody who brings, a, you don't need a stack of business cards. You need three or four. Um, and, and when you're talking with somebody and it's important and you want to get to know them and your friend comes up and goes, hey, can I interrupt you a second? You can look at your friend very lovingly and say, do you mind? Let me enter, This is Joe. I'm talking to Joe for a minute. We just met. And I really want to find out more about Joe. I'll meet you guys a little later. Right? You don't have to stop networking and growing your business because your friends want to take you over to the bar to have a drink. So that's why. So, that's just a couple of sets. Uh, I'd say that that's one of the things that I've done myself personally, like going to conferences and stuff to stop myself. You, you, you market, uh, you target uh, certain key people that you, you kind of want to get to know and you just go out and try to meet them. Um, work through people that know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. Um, and, and just even through that, you've already caused a ripple in, in your marketing plan with people getting to know who you are. Um, another key thing that, uh, that Mary brought up 
uh, as well as uh, SEO, getting online, new media. Um, any of you guys doing any of that stuff? Sure. Yes. Of course. <laughs> like what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because we've, we've changed so much now from a, a traditional print background um, that there's so much new technology out there. It's, it's a whole new uh, marketplace now. And what are you guys doing, or, or what can you help um, our audience know to get out there using this new technology? Well, it's funny, um, because I just moved to Jacksonville just over a year ago, and I worked for two, New York, two years in New York and two years in Chicago. And the reason it's really helped me is that at least it engages me with my contacts in those cities. So I probably use LinkedIn more than anything just because I'm always trying to network through that because I'm not networking face to face. It's, hey, remember me? I was on the board of directors with you four years ago for the YWCA or just trying to reconnect with those people. Um, so I really use an online presence in, in that aspect. Strangely, and, and I don't know if you guys might disagree with me, I'm not as concerned as someone Googling like Jacksonville graphic designer. Um, I'm really trying to get clients for referrals and people that really want to work with me. That's just a personal strategy that I've had. So strangely, I'm not as concerned about search engine optimization. Again, that might be cause for, for conflict. Um, but a, a lot of the, the work for me has, has come referral based. I mean, I am search engine optimized, and if people do Google my name, it comes up. Um, but I'm, I'm really looking for referral-based clients because they tend to be better relationships. And that's I'm looking for a long-term relationship, not a single job. I want you know that long-term commitment. Mm -hmm. Jill? Um, well, yeah, I mean, same thing. I mean, I have a website, but um, no, nobody would probably find me uh, just by typing you know, graphic design Jacksonville um, because really all my clients come through referral. Um, so... I, you know, I don't have a blog. Well, uh, you're coming from a more of the traditional side. Yeah, I, I, so I am. I, you know, I, I do specialize more mm -hmm. in, you know, print and stuff. But, uh, so I, I could definitely, you know, beef up the electronic side. Of what is this craze going around now called like, Twitter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you guys do any of that? What are these advantages? Advantages of that. I use it for recruiting because it's a quick way to send down a message that I have an opening for a senior graphic designer with heavy print experience mm -hmm. or a public relations person who has community relations experience or whatever. I mean, it's a very quick way to get that out. Um, but I was going to say on the on the end of Michelle's talk about networking and why you're here and the three people. I'll say something just amazing, which is one of the best things you can do to those three people is take their business card and write them a handwritten note that says, I really enjoyed talking to you about your love of Labrador Retrievers or um, your particular interest in design for the web or whatever you talk to them about. Um, an old-fashioned handwritten note with just a plain old stamp on it goes a long That's radical. way. It's just, <laughs> and it it's goes affordable. a long way, and I and I show my age when I say that. Um, even a quick email helps. It's especially true if the note that the note card you send is handmade. It yeah, really if it expresses that. your creative capabilities, yes, you're right. Just don't but it it also shows you somebody who has a follow through, and you know you were really listening to what that person said. It's a really good tactic. I've actually used something similar to that, like just doing portfolio reviews, keeping in contact with some of the students that I've reviewed. Um, it, it just, again, that ripple effect that happens. Um, so, back to the Twitter thing. Is that a good thing or not a good thing? They're, they're, I'm trying to get to uh, the level of involvement someone should have in this new media technology, uh, being a, a freelancer or a, a startup business. How much should they invest in being online really, when, you know, some, coming from a traditional background that it's who you need on the side? Um, what are the advantages of this new media? I, I can address that uh, quite a bit. I, talk, I do have the opportunity to talk about that a lot. First, the, one of the challenges, there are great tools like TweetDeck and Nambu and all these other tools. How many of you use one of those tools to follow your Twitter feed? And do you leave it on all day long and do you find yourself sucked down the rabbit hole? Uh -huh. I mean, so turn them off. Because it doesn't matter if it's important, you're probably going to find out, right? But but Twitter is very important 
Um, and if you're looking for particular things or you're following a large group of people and looking for some small stuff, you can have a feed that you check in the morning, in midday, and in the evening. And, and if it's someone who really needs to reach you, they're probably not trying to direct message you through Twitter, oh my God, can you go to lunch anymore? Because that's really not how it's hardly, it's hardly being used that way, right? Um, but, but same thing for Facebook and, and, all the, and, and even LinkedIn. You can get sucked down a rabbit hole and not get your work done. So it can impact productivity seriously. On the flip side, you can leverage automated tools. You can leverage um, relationships that way, and you can develop some of your brand. So as I was sitting here before before I we started, I was like, ooh, just seconds away, we're, we're kicking off at AIGA, right? Because every time I go to speak, it's important for me to promote that I'm speaking. The darndest things happen. It gets me more speaking engagements. It's fantastic. So, so it is important to do it as long as you're balancing that you're not letting being involved in social media suck you away from actually getting work done. If that makes sense, that sounds true. Well, and the other thing I think you have to do is be conscious of your brand. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be careful what mm -hmm. you say. I'm a raging lunatic Democrat, just a huge fan of Barack Obama, and will tell anybody, and I'm forever posting things on my Facebook page that are just left, left, left liberal, and all these people just come at me, come at my throat from the right. And I think, you know, this is probably not real good for business. <laughs> so I don't listen to my own <laughs> advice on this topic, but I think you have to be careful. You know, if you go out drinking with friends and start tweeting crazy stuff. Instead of drunk cell calls, now it's drunk tweets, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, you, and, you know, what's on your Facebook page? Some people have a professional Facebook page and a personal Facebook page. I heard something on NPR about that today. Um, so I think you just have to think. I think LinkedIn is much more Brooks Brothers suit business-like kind of stuff. Um, Facebook tends to be more friendship stuff. So there's nobody you're going to be on LinkedIn, Mary. You just drove them all the way from LinkedIn. I'm on it. Well, Emily says she uses it. I use LinkedIn more for professional. Yeah, but that's but where their yeah. clients are. That's Absolutely. what they need to be doing. It's, yeah, for, for me, for Facebook is friends and only friends. I do not use that as a, I mean, granted, I can still talk to my friends about what I'm doing and they might refer me, but I'm not going to be friends with a client on that. That's for certain. And I think the same goes for Twitter for me, but LinkedIn is really what I use to get clients. Um, I have a question in yes. to that. And I've heard a couple people talk about it, but what would you do if a client sends you a request on Facebook or, or I the deny other them. Do you? Yes, do you, I do. you don't have any... No, actually, I, I normally will just write a, a short note. I mean, I've had, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm just very honest with my clients, too. And, and no, actually, I think that's only happened to me twice now. But I've just hit decline or just, hey, if you need to reach me, here's my email address or, or just something like that. So you but, almost have like a client profile type that you're, you're going after as well. So it like is, I'm very, hit you through Facebook, it's like you're I'm not very targeted at who I want to work with, too. But I think that that's only happened to me twice. And I've just hit <laughs> but if it is a client sending that note, and I, and I had yeah. that happen to me last week. In fact, I cut it. I said, uh, they said, they said, Michelle, thanks for contacting me. I use Facebook only for my family and immediate friend contact mm -hmm. stuff. I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Please click here to go to my LinkedIn profile and connect. Mm -hmm. And I was not offended uh, at all, not even a little bit. I was like, oh, that's cool. Okay, I get it. No problem. Mm -hmm. Click over the LinkedIn. Yeah, well, I think she kind of addressed it. And very interesting. I've heard a lot. You make a distinction. Here's my personal Facebook. Here's LinkedIn. But I can look at a lot of really great designers I know here in town, and I see a real cross thing of personal. Hey, I got an invitation to come to this thing on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So you know, we're saying one. You know, I think you just made the point. Some people. Mingle, co mingle that. And I co mingle. I, I do. I don't have I don't any know if there's a right or wrong answer to that. <laughs> I'll be your friend if you can fog a mirror. You know, if you'll send me a request. <laughs> <laughs> uh, until you prove otherwise, uh, I will friend with anybody. I, you, we laugh, right? But I don't know who Joe Smith, who said, you know, I saw you at this meeting and I'd just like to see what you're talking about. I have no idea. Joe Smith could work for Random House. And that might be a great, you know, opportunity for me. You know, so I will. I don't. I, I don't have any separation. But I also am very aware that I don't share anything on there that I wouldn't want anyone who can see my profile 
to see. So there are no new pictures or anything like that. <laughs> no, disappointing, but true. Just a point. Um, Facebook does have business pages right. as well as personal profiles. So you can have a separation of church and state or how you want to do it on Facebook. I was going to say well, that. I have an agency a la carte Facebook page right. and my own personal Facebook page. I've seen um, friends and colleagues have used Facebook to their advantage. Like they put up, use it as their portfolio piece. And because they have more friends there, that's, that's their word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's really how you want to use it. Um, so a lot of this is going towards um, how you want to, how you want your business to be profiled as, how you want it to be portrayed, um, what are the networks that you want to get into. Um, one of the things that uh, I was thinking about with like Twitter and stuff was uh, to to also market yourself out there. You need to get involved in conversations. So you may not know somebody, but by following them, you can almost get into the same conversation feed, and then for them to respond back, that's a that's a big hit to you. Uh, just because you're participating in the conversation. And that's what a lot of this is about. It, it's taking the networking offline to get online. And that, that you know, becomes like a really smart thing to do. Do you guys participate in like forums or the Twitter conversations or stuff? I don't. For LinkedIn, because they have a... I think you just sense. have to follow what your personality is and what feels comfortable to you. And Emily at very obviously has some very specific rules for her that are comfortable for her. Um, I post political stuff all the time and don't really worry about it. One of the things I'd like to sort of chime in is I work for MetLife, a major corporation, and we're blocked mm -hmm. from Facebook, many of these things. So. If you're looking for corporate clients, most of them can get linked in, but we can't access any of these other things that we yeah. work in, and it's strictly prohibited. I mean, you can't get there, so you have to realize that a lot of corporate places won't even let you see those things. But with that said, you got your cell phone now that you're on Facebook in meetings that you should be listening to the meeting and you're Facebooking <laughs> instead. No. <laughs> I mean, that's just, I don't get it. We should have a running tweet feed right now to see what everyone's saying. I thought it would be rude for me to tweet from the, I saw that at TwitterCon and the guys were like, he was too busy tweeting about his answer to answer like the group that was sitting in front of him. I thought that's kind of rude, right? There's a balance. There is a balance to all these tweets. Is there another point that I uh, so again, we, we barely even touched like the work side of these things still. Um, before we move on again, is there any question on like marketing yourselves out, like getting yourself exposed? Um, exposing yourself. Exposing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I want to ask a question about the group. Yeah. How many of you have a written marketing plan for your business? Yay. How long does it have to be? <laughs> Link this a sheet of paper. I mean, a written marketing plan. And for the one person that has a written marketing plan, are you executing it? Yes. Fantastic. It's only, and how's ten, business? it's only ten items long. And how's business, by the way? It's pretty good. Good. So, so you guys. And the chamber, UNF, there are places you can take classes and free workshops on how to get that done. Yeah. As a, from a lawyer's perspective of marketing, because you know we all have to move our, do our own marketing, I really don't think I found anything online to be really that helpful in terms of getting a good client. Really, mm -hmm. It's really more, I, I do lunches all the time. You know, just if you meet someone interesting, if you don't want to do that, well, if you don't want to do the hard sell, and who does really want to do the hard sell? It just never goes over anyway. And, and there may not be a good fit. Yes, we see any lunches here. Uh, and so, and so I, I really have found my own marketing you know, plan is much more low key. You know, it's just you, you have to just let people know you exist and that you that they will want to do business with you. It's sort of the things that you guys were mentioning that they would like spending time with you. They think you're an intelligent person. That you have a in for you guys the whole creative thing. And I do think a lunch is a great way to do it. You know, you say so. I'd love to hear more about your business. You invite them to lunch. I mean, it sort of gets a little pay. expensive, but. And you have to pay. Maybe. A lot of actually companies will not let you pay. So they say it's got to be Dutch. It's sort of interesting. Um, 
And then the other thing that I do is I just really uh, make sure that when you're doing something that's with, with, you do a lot of things in your life probably that you don't think of marketing opportunities, I go to the dog park a lot. And it's not really purposeful to get clients or anything, but I just am crazy about my dog. My dog needs a lot of exercise. And I really think a lot of dog people are nice, you know, it turns out they are. And so if you, you know, just don't be too shy about mentioning what you do in all these different circumstances of your life. And so, and, and I think that's what comes back to play and then the opportunity for the lunch will come up and then just, and if you have a really good brand, they'll remember you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some of the key things that, that you guys mentioned was like, get out there and network and be personable. Be, be yourself and be yourself. I think be yourself, yourself is a huge thing, because I know when I first started going to my first networking events, I felt this need to even cover a tattoo or just act really professional or so. And then over time, I realized that I wasn't selling myself to truly who I was. And that I think something that's really important with my clients is I get overexcited about things. I, I talk, I mean, I'm just totally myself. And if they like it, that's great because then we're going to be a, a good match. So don't feel like you have to play a role when trying to get clients. Just be who you are. That's my, my best advice. Do you have any tips for finding qualified leads? Because when you go out networking a lot, you meet, I meet a lot of people who aren't necessarily going to be your best client. You end up spending a lot of time talking to them, and you know they want quotes. It, it just it, sometimes it just spirals out of control. Do you have any tips on finding really good qualified leads? Well, you your kiss lots thing. of frogs. <laughs> just the way it is. It's just like dating. Yeah, it's just like dating. <laughs> well, probably you your can, own clients, right? If yeah. you can meet people to introduce you to other people, you know, mm -hmm. like that kind of thing, I think it's really good. Yeah. And trust me, <coughs> God. I mean, sometimes you're meeting with someone and your your gut is like, this doesn't feel right, but you're like, but it could pay me. I mean, my honest, just trust your gut. If it, if it feels wrong, it probably is. Um, so you can be select. You can say no. You don't have to take every job. You know, if someone comes to you, you can turn it away if it doesn't feel right. And that's one big reason for working for yourself, right, Jill? Yep. You can walk away. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, you can do that. One of, the, one of the things that I've done um, personally with, when I've come across a client that I, I get the gut feeling that it's not going to be right, price yourself out. Um, and, and price it to a point where it's like, what's going to be the amount that's going to make it worth it? <laughs> now, now the part that's crazy is when they do pay it, and you're just like, don't pay him. <laughs> it, it, it's happened to me already like once or twice, and I, I went through, did the work, and felt good about getting the money that I was getting paid. <laughs> so that's another tactic: price yourself out, out of it, and see if they they push or. Show. Usually that works real well when you give them a high, a high bid. <laughs> So we're kind of segueing into like the work side of things now. Um, like, how how do you guys manage the day now that you're 24 hours yourself, pretty much? Because I, I know personally that it, it it can impede and like you know I've read many times that they say keep those work hours strict to nine to five, but. I was never strict when I oh, was yeah, normally anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. I was a I was a midnighter type. So so how do you manage your time working projects? Well well I'm I'm pretty organized as we determined earlier. Yeah. <laughs> I really do keep I, I always like keeping regular work hours actually, which is kind of strange for a design and art director, but um, you know, I really get because I work out of my house, you know, and so it's like my office is sort of like I don't, I don't go in there and work at odd hours, you know. I, like, I'm there by 9 o'clock, you know, I'm working, and then when I'm done, I'm done. You know, and so, and I don't tend to, if I've got stuff going on, you know, if, I, if I'm not that busy, yeah, I'm going to fool around a little bit. But, um, you know, I, I just sit down and just focus and do it. But that's just kind of my nature. I keep nine to five hours, but the main reason I do that is also my clients have nine to five hours, and I want them to be able to call me and know when I'm accessible. Um, and that's that's really important that when they call, that you can either answer the phone or call them right back, because their office hours are probably nine to five as well. Um, and I've been trying really hard to, to stop at five o'clock. But the one thing I've learned, because I work from home and I live at home, how do I make that mental transition? Um, I do walk, you know, out of my office, but I've even learned just like doing a long run or just getting out and just doing something to, to tell your body I'm changing modes, because that is hard when you're working from home. Mm -hmm. It is a challenge. There's lots going on with TV and stuff. <laughs> 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 
We all work different ways. <laughs> I would like to work with a lot of noise. They're laughing because they get that. That's, yeah. that's why. I don't even own a TV. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my God, you don't watch Mad Men? I think you can Hulu that, can't you, Lee? <laughs> if I work from home, I'd be going to that refrigerator all day. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's difficult. Now, I, ha I went to work from home, and we moved into an office space, and then... I was working from home, living with my mother-in-law, which in itself is pretty interesting. And I've just got an office space again, um, and because we want to travel next year, and so we're down, so we're downsizing our lives so we can be mobile and travel and, and get really clear about working in this four to five hour time frame during the day and, and playing the other, playing and sleeping the other 19 to 21 hours, right? Um, because really, if you think about it, when you work on a regular job in a regular office, you get about three hours worth of work done in two days. And, uh, and so you guys laugh, but it's true. Think about all the times you're not working. Um, but the same thing can happen at home. I mean, the day can slip away. You go, where, 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 what happened? Uh, a great tip, though, is to use like a time management sheet. Um, you can make a spreadsheet, put the, the time of day. Uh, my, one of my coaches I've worked with has says to do a 15-minute timer. I've had another one say do an hour. And at the hour, on the hour, right now, what am I doing right now? Right, especially if you're wondering where the day went. What am I doing right now? Um, and, and then after one week, after one week, you can see where the time went right. And that, it's just a little accountability thing. But ultimately, if you want to stay in business and be successful and make money, you actually have to do the work that people pay you to do on time within budget. Imagine that. Um, so that is just a personal responsibility, whether you want the TV on or not. Right. And back to Jill's point about if you're new to the workforce, it's a good idea to go work somewhere for someone. I know working in an advertising agency in the early part of my career was very valuable in terms of time management and billing. And if you write down every hour what you're doing, you're going to have a whole lot better time next week when you've got to do your bills, remembering whether that took you three hours or five hours or what. Um, and that's something I learned working in an ad agency where we were required to report every 15 minutes of time, and it was a whole lot better if it was billable time to a client than if it was just sitting around shooting the breeze. So those kind of things. Uh, the other thing I've done, uh, I did from the very start 15 years ago when I decided to work from home was put in a separate phone line that is my office phone. And it rings in my office and it doesn't ring anywhere else in the house. So that's a very separate thing because I think I would find myself on the phone continuously if I didn't have that separate line. I'd also like to add, um, it, it's a learning part that you have to do to, to keep management of your time. Um, I'd have to say, like, in my in our first years of starting Engine Works, uh, you know, we didn't keep track of our time, so it, it's one of those things that, like, well, it took about this amount of time to do it. Um, when you get that same project, type of project that comes back around again, you have no basis of what to, to charge now because you, you don't know how long it took you. So it's really important to, to keep track of your time so that you, you know how long it takes you to do a certain task so that you can use that as your base to, to move forward um, and you know get yourself a good rate to, to charge by. Um, do you guys have any um, uh, recommendations on any time management or project management? Yeah. <laughs> I use a little program called Mac Freelance, and it's like it runs with another one very similar to it called Stopwatch. And it'll it'll you know generate invoices and stuff like that if you want it to. But so easy because you just fill in your client information and you just click start. The little, the little stopwatch spins around while you're working, and then when you stop, you, you stop it. It adds it all up for you. And that's really great, Eric, about keeping track of how long something took because it's like when somebody asks you to give you an estimate and you don't know how long it normally takes, you know, that's bad. Yeah. That's why you price yourself out. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah exactly. It's or you underestimate. Or you underestimate. That's when you start to hate the yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. So it's wonderful to have, you know, a, a whole uh, a history of how long things take. Or things you can it's, for students, I think you it's a really good thing to, to like, you know, test yourself like how long it takes you to do certain things so that you can get out to the workplace. You can all, already have like that, that mindset. Um, so can we talk about as a beginning business owner, especially if you're a student now, and can we talk about how do you set 
the, the price and how do you go about um, proposals and billing? Where do you go? To where? I mean, all of y'all had to start somewhere. Where do you go to get that info? And then how do you go about executing it? There's a great website out there, but is it the design, the Center for Practice Management? I don't know if you guys have been there. It's part of the AIGA's national site, but it answers all of those questions in thorough, incredible documents um, written for designers um, that really talks about, you know, there are some mathematical equations if you really want to get into it about what your hourly rate should be. I think you have to figure out what your bottom line is. But I think you do kind of have to get your feet wet and collect a little bit of data. I mean, there's a learning curve. I mean, there were definitely projects I started out on, and I, I learned the hard way on some things, but as I collected data, I could estimate more properly. Um, what is it, the Graphic Artist Guild also does the pricing and ethical guide, is that the correct name yes. of it? And um, they always kind of take data on, you know, average hourly rates or how much it is for a logo for a small, you know, client, um, things like that. They even have sample uh, proposals and estimates in there that you could always use the base but refine for your, yourself too. So those are some great resources. Sure. Um, it's the AIGA Center of Practice Management. Yeah, is that right? Am I yeah. saying? It, it, I was going to mention the end in case nobody yeah. brought it up. It's a great cpm.aiga.org. And it's a, it's a huge resource. It's, I think I have a lot of this stuff. It's kind of talked over. It's got it documented. And they have a lot of big names that actually have written for it. So, um, they have a contract on them too. They have contracts. They have no standards of. Um, mm -hmm. They have ethical standards, yeah. Uh, they have, a, they have a, um, you know, like a, a basic contract that's almost kind of modular, mm -hmm. um, depending on what the business is like. I can't exactly describe it fully, but uh, it's been revised uh, a few times over. But uh, it's got a lot of good resources, and like Emily said, it's actually a section that talks about how you can figure out your hourly rate. So, uh, There's it's also a, sal a salary survey. Yeah. They, uh -huh. they, do, they do touch on freelance. You can go to salary.com and search by area of the country. And part of what you can do is figure out what your annual salary would be and about what that is an hour, and then figure you're paying your own taxes, insurance, you know, you're carrying a lot of uh, whatever physical plant you work in, your phone, whatever your expenses are added on top of what your salary would be. Um, and you can just ask around. Yeah, I was just going to say, you can just ask other people who are doing it that, you know, would be willing to share with you, you know, what they're charging. Yeah, I mean, that gives you kind of an idea of what yeah. other people are charging, but I think that it's, it is kind of good to go through the exercise of mm -hmm. figuring out your own rate, because years of experience, talent, all kind of plays a part in terms of how much or how little you charge. Um, and the worst thing you can do is undercharge yourself or overcharge mm -hmm. I mean, you can just do the same. Mary, is it you who told me that if every if every single client hires you, you're not charging enough? No. Okay. <laughs> so I've heard that before. Like if, you, if you put a proposal out and you get hired every single time, and nobody's balking on your price and nobody's questioning, it may be that you are the lowest one in the pack. And it's not bad that you're getting hired, but if you were charging ten dollars an hour or more, um, in a and you're getting twenty worth of that work. 20 hours of work a week, well, that's an extra $800 a month. That's an extra $9,600 a year. So FYI, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not true of how other people feel about that, but I've heard if you're getting 100% of your jobs, your price may be just a little too low, and you can test, um, you know, your rates and, and things like that. So, and I don't, I don't know. A lot of people don't tell, this is my hourly rate. They go, this is what I would charge for this project and make it harder for people to price shop. So, yeah. Yes. I wonder how much Jill charges for I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is, um, you guys would like you to address this maybe, uh, might be so positioned or focused, this may not be an issue for you, um, but I have friends who are freelancers that are saying, the pro in this economy, there's so many people underpricing, it's hard, there's a lot of, a lot of for people in this room who are just coming out on the street and as soon as, you're getting away work or whatever. Has that, has that impacted you at all? Or does that make sense what I'm saying? It may, yeah, rates say, have gone maybe, down. Yeah. Rates have definitely gone down in the last couple of years. Um, but people who are established, like Jill, and probably you, um, I don't know that your rates are 
I don't know that I you have to compromise. I didn't go, I didn't go down, down. And, I, and I'm not really sure that I'm, I'm not aware of people that are undercutting me. Maybe they are, and I don't know. Yeah, I haven't. Actually, I feel like I'm, I'm charging at a fair rate. I haven't cut anything. Actually, I feel like it's more of a freelancer's market at the moment. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I've noticed a lot of clients are afraid to make commitments with large agencies or firms because they're worried that then they have to pay the designer fee, the account manager fee, and then they're going to try to upsell them on all these things. So I, I feel like lately a lot of people are looking to work with one individual. Um, so I've actually found that this economy has really helped me in my business. Well, I think that's true too. Michael, that's a, I think you had a similar question we talked about earlier, like the economy, how is that affecting like that. How does it affect like you guys as, as freelancers, or how would it affect freelancers as small business? And you know, you guys said you guys are still. Well, I think it's to long. your advantage if you want to freelance because we have clients who, a year or two years ago, would have hired someone full time, and now instead of doing that, they'll contract a freelancer through us uh, because they don't want to make that full time commitment, mm -hmm. or they'll hire somebody like Jill or Emily to do a brochure or right, a, project. a project. A lot of times you don't realize that you know your, your employer pays your salary, but not double. But I mean, there's all those other taxes on top of it. So sometimes it is a lot cheaper for a company and a hard time to use freelancers as opposed to having a full-time employee and paying benefits or investing in their you know retirement plan. So I think that has been an advantage for, for me. I wanted to touch upon an important point. I know you were asking about like proposals and forms, and this is something that I am like a huge advocate for is is getting everything in writing. I have seen so many people burned in the past, especially with pro bono work um, or just doing verbal agreements or things like that. I am a huge advocate of writing detailed estimates and proposals and having the client sign on the dotted line outlining all of the expectations. I haven't run into any issues yet, but just knowing people that have, I've really gone out of my way to cover myself. And I do the same with a, a pro bono client. I mean, I do the same type of contract. I, and again, AIGA is a great source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with you on that. Um, I actually had one of my first jobs out as a freelancer. I missed, you know, didn't put in some, some elements that I know I should have put in there. So when the project was done, I had constant revisions and I was like, well, I'm going to charge you for these hourly. And he was like, I didn't understand that. And then I felt so bad at that point, like, it's my fault that I didn't explain to him that, you know, this was the set amount for this project and as we go over it, it's going to accumulate in hours by that time. And because I didn't say that, I felt that I just, you know, bit the bullet and fixed up some revisions, gave it to him. Um, but that it's a it's a really key important part is get everything down like whatever you're working on get get down those details of what you're providing for your client. One of the first jobs I did when I started kind of brokering for other people, uh, I was talking with a client and they said to me they needed some artwork done and they said we don't like to work with so and so and I said wow that person is one of my favorite designers why do you not like to work with that person and they said oh well last year we asked them to do our annual report and they said it would cost like twenty five hundred dollars and then we didn't get what we paid for and I said what do you mean exactly and they said well when it was finished we got a CD with all the artwork on it and we needed two thousand copies yeah. Because they didn't understand that the graphic design stopped and the print production picked up. And then they were going to have to pay the printer to do it. But also that not all art directors realize that they need to do the print production. So their expectations were completely out of whack for what the reality was. I don't think that was anybody's fault in particular. It was just that nobody discussed up front, like Emily said, what are the details. Or the line in your contract, like, final deliverables will be in the form of print-ready files. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, just... And one of the that. reasons I think you should talk to a lawyer like Kate or someone like her is because there are all the issues of who owns what yeah. mm -hmm. yes. when you're done. And, you know, I've seen so many people get in trouble with pictures they thought were royally free that weren't, or things they got an illustrator to do that then the person wanted more money later. It, it, it just... Yes. So many things can, and again, the AIGA website's a great resource. And, and Mary, not just on pictures now, but on audio. 
is uh -huh. becoming a problem on websites or commercials or things because now you're no longer making the CD to go in somebody's lobby. It's getting put on YouTube. YouTube is being contacted, and I, we talked to the guys from Vidler at the West Conference this weekend, and I had lunch with a guy, and he said that they got a suit for $260,000 for one video that had copyrighted music that it shouldn't have on there. And they ended up helping the person who put it up negotiate it out, but the original suit was for $260,000 for this one thing. So that's why on the world's stuff. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I think that it's not just also the issue of, well, do they own what you're going to deliver? But the other areas, so there's stuff that they've given to you, and, and you, it's very important, I think, for your sake, for your sake to make clear that they, if, if this is what's going to happen, they can <coughs> clear that stuff. You can't know who owns that or the photographs of their employees, you know, that they're giving you. It really should be clear that they are responsible, unless you're going to be responsible, then you know it, and then you take that step. But whatever they're giving you, that they've got the right to use it in however they're going to use it because your name's going to be on there and you're going to be sucked into the lawsuit. Number two, your stuff that you're creating for them, who's going to own that? And that's a really, you know, a total question. negotiable issue. You may need a lot of that stuff. You know, you can't possibly give the ownership to them unless they're going to pay you a gazillion dollars because it may be a building block of, your, of, your, of what you designed for lots of people and have already designed, used, you know, produced work for other, other clients using that. But then there's the middle stuff. The, the stuff that you may need to take from other places, or they are expecting you to take from other places, be really clear on who's responsible for clearing that or getting the licenses to that, whether it's programming, whether it's photographs, whether it's music. And it's really great to have these sort of buckets of things that you, you know, it just needs to be clear in the agreement. And, uh, and, and so that, you know, it's, there's not a surprise later. There's always going to be screw-ups since we have any deal. But the best way to avoid it is to have a readable, easy to understand, but clear agreement that tries to cover most of the services. Even if it's just a checklist. Yeah. I even, which I don't know, I just hired my lawyer for one hour of his time to just go through all my legal copy. It's the same in every contract, just to be safe. Yeah, I mean, your boiler just, plate. Yep. You know, because, I mean, every proposal is different, but for the most part, your legal copy in it will be the same. I mean, it might vary, but it is good just to have another set of eyes just to avoid that. And to me, I think that one hour of a <coughs> time is really worth the investment. Can we talk about photographs? By law, um, isn't it? I read somewhere, I'm pretty sure, that by law, don't you have to give credit to the photographer if you publish a photograph? Depends on what your agreement is, probably, but that's one of those things that there's so many different ways to look at it. I would say you just need to be real clear up front where the photograph came from and what's the expectation of the photographer. Well, if you have nothing in writing, however, in the U.S., this is sort of a moral rights question, actually. Interestingly enough, there's certain kinds of photographs that are governed by the federal moral rights law, and a lot of fine art is governed. It's only that kind of work, and it's photography, it's fine art photography that's actually created for exhibition purposes, not commercial photography. That kind of photography, you would, could, if you don't give someone credit when you're using the, the photograph, you could run into a federal moral rights claim, which is sort of like a copyright claim. But most photography is not going to fall into that bucket, and there is no duty under federal, under U.S. law, to give someone a credit for that kind of thing unless it's in the agreement. Um, actually, interesting enough, in academics, there's this concept of what we call plagiarism, which is not infringement, and it isn't that, which is that you're ethically bound, really, not to take someone's concepts. So that if you're talking about, you know, it's not a photography issue, it's more talking about their ideas, things like that. That's, that's often referred to as academic plagiarism. And so that's a, a you know, reference issue. But with, with respect to sort of standard commercial pho uh, photographs, no, but you can't copy them. You know, there's a, if the photographer owns the copyright, you're going to run into problems if you copy them or transmit them or publish them on the web without their permission. I'd love to see how that transitions out to like illustrative work, because I know there's a good handful of illustrators in here, but I'm curious how, how that would work out. Is it, the same, is it the same manner for illustration used for a uh, design element? Well, whatever happened to the guy that did the Obama poster that supposedly yeah. he's, he's, he's in trouble. Yeah, he's, he's in, in trouble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, he was sued. Well, he actually apparently did something that they just discovered, which is he um, he uh, apparently just changed his story about which photograph he took it from. Which never that never looks good in the lawsuit. Right. So I think he's having some problems. But he googled Obama and he took the first thing that popped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
to get us a little bit back on track from that, um, the to get back to like the project based kind of stuff, uh, is there anything out there that you guys are using right now to help you organize all the, the work that you guys are getting? Instead of like time management, is there anything that you work with your client to keep your, your projects managed or do you just do it like in file folders, keeping like elements together? Is there anything that you can help uh, our audience know about organization? Basecamp? Basecamp? Yeah, I would say something uh, too, is at least from accounting perspective, is making sure your files are organized. I know like I sometimes you go to a designer's desktop and there's just stuff everywhere. I've really learned that it's great to give every client a number, every project a number, just so if you do have to refer back to something, you can find it easily. Um, and I use Basecamp as well. Um, the other thing um, is backup systems in place. Um, that's something that's really important for liability. Um, for example, um, you know, what happens if your computer crashes? I mean, just make sure that you have backups going on. And in a sense, that's kind of an organizational thing as well. I mean, you just need to make sure that you have things in multiple places that you can access them if necessary. Which brings up another point, which I always think is really a, a terrible thing to say to all you guys, but you're going to have to buy your own software. <laughs> and really have the license to the software. Because if in the middle of the night, whatever version of Quark you have that you borrowed from your cousin Ooh, crashes know. and your hard drive's gone or whatever, um, you know, if you go get another computer real quick and can't reinstall it, you're going to have some serious problems. So it's, it's that point where you grow up, it's sort of like buying bookcases instead of using bricks and boards. You know, buying real furniture. Yeah. You gotta buy the real software. And that's a tough thing. That's a hard thing to come to terms with doing. Well you don't want to be infringing anyway, let me say that you know yeah. well, that's true. Microsoft is very aggressive about pursuing people yeah, but who we're take... all Mac people, so Oh that's <laughs> <laughs> Mac doesn't care, it's just kidding. <laughs> okay. Well that's that, that, funny. I've never had that before. <laughs> you don't want to you don't want to be it really Someone's shouldn't. Copy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's copyright infringement. And you're in the business where you want to be able to say you understand that and you, you know, respect it. And exactly. It, you really, it, they find out about it in interesting ways. And suddenly it's this walking problem. I always like to look at it as it's a minimum investment for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, you stand up. Well, uh, staying current it deals with software, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you do? Hey, I'm going to get into Final Cut Pro. How do you take time to do all of that with running a business or any other software for that matter? Or how do you stay fresh, conceptually and perceptual? You know, do a long walk, do you paint? Hang with AIGA people. <laughs> Listen well, heavy, to heavy drinking. Yeah. <laughs> Jill, 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 I know you do adjunct work in kitchen. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was very inspirational when I did it. <laughs> I have, I have um, borrowed training CDs to learn software before in, in those weeks. There are parts of weeks where I wasn't that busy. So that, I mean, that's how I've done that. Linda.com? Yeah, I think yeah. you'll notice when you're on your own, you're going to have Very like, expensive. you know, a busy weeks and slow weeks, and it's going to go, it's going to ebb and flow. And in the slow weeks, I mean, I have no problems. I actually just recently just taught myself more CSS and HTML for buying a book this thick and doing all the tutorials in it and just going through the whole thing. Um, you really have to take it upon yourself to constant. I mean, there's courses too. It just depends on how you learn. Um, there's definitely uh, you have to dedicate a lot of that. I would say um, because you know if you're coming from print and you want to get into Final Cut Pro, that is a huge, huge I'm jump. For example. Yeah. yeah. But you, if you do it, then it's one of the things where you have to dedicate yourself. Um, and that, that, for me personally, yeah, that's that's one of the reasons why I'm up where I was because I wanted to get into something totally different. So now I can devote that time for learning how to do it properly. Uh, we're about to wrap up pretty soon, so I'm going to open it up to everybody for any questions, additional questions. Yes, Pat. Yeah, the questions might be geared a little bit more towards Kate, but um, what's something that, um, as like a designer illustrator, we could easily do to protect our work? Because I do a lot of stuff and I just post it on my site, and I just kind of have a quick little, you know, all material copyright by you know, my name. Etc. Is there anything else sure. um, that I can do to kind of safeguard that? Because I've seen some 
designers, people just rip their stuff off and they'll print on their shirt and someone else is selling it. Right. You know, another way, you know, an expensive way to kind of yeah. protect the money. Well, it, I mean, the copyright law is incredibly protective of you. Incredibly. Unlike trademark law and stuff like that where, you know, I'm telling you all these fancy things, um, or patents, you know, if you've got some new process, it's a lot of money to protect the patent. But copyright law is like the moment you create it, you have the copyright in it, right? So we, we know you have that. So what else can you do? Because you have that. It's nothing that you, you know, used to be that if you didn't put the notice on it, you're going to lose it. it. Used to be if you published it without the notice, you could lose it. All kinds of things, sort of interesting. Um, but now, you've got it. The moment you create it, you own it. And, you know, there's some work for higher issues if you're an employee of a company. You don't own it, <laughs> unless there's a written agreement otherwise. But let's just say you're doing it yourself and you're the sole proprietor. Your company or you own it. So, what else can you do? You put your copyright notice on it just so and you don't have to do that anymore. It used to be you really had to and you lose it. But the only reason you do it now is you're trying to, you know, ring the bell. I own this and you, if you copy it, you are a willful infringer. That's one thing you're doing. So you know, you can copyright the scene with the circle, your name, and the year you finished it. You know, you first published it or finished it, whichever occurs, which, whichever has last occurred. But typically, it's going to be if you're going to put it on the web, it's the day you published the year you published it. Now, what else can you do? Well, the copyright office also has a process where you can register the copyright. And if you haven't published these things, offered copies for sale, you can register all of your work in one forty-five dollar filing. I think it is. And the copyright, you know, if you copyright.gov, you go on there and they will, and the, actually the copyright office people are very, you know, pretty helpful. You don't have to wait on, on the phone too much. But they have a very, you know, very, I think, easy to follow guidance as to how you do that. And so let's say you complete your registration, which is you put your, the title of the work and your, your name as you're the author, the date you finished it, things like that, and you get it registered, which you just send it in. You're not going to hear from them for ages. But the date of registration is going to be the date, effective date you filed it with them as long as you did it right. So $45 for all your unpublished work or $45 for all the work that was published in one group. Right? So you can do that. And what does that get you? Well, that gets you a lot because if someone infringes, you can write them a nice letter, which I've written a lot of people. It says, stop using my work. It is registered. And if you can, and I'm going to sue you. And if I sue you and win, you have to pay my attorney fees. Right? Your attorney fees, which is what everyone's scared about because they're ridiculously expensive. In addition, in addition, you don't have to show you've been damaged. You don't have to show, well, I've sold my work for a million dollars. You don't have to show that. They have something called statutory damages, which are um, can range up to $150,000 for willful infringement per work. I mean, you don't you know, often get that, but that's, that, that looks really good in a letter. You should stop. I mean, I used to actually um, be the director of something called Volunteer the Arts in New York. And in New York, you know, you'd have a lot of artists come in. They're very starting out, and they had, but they had definitely registered their work, and they came in and we write these letters, and people would stop because, I mean, often people I just don't understand. It's not really these, there's not a lot of, you know, I mean, there's probably a lot of nasty people out there, I should say that, but I'm just saying most people who infringe are often doing it without quite understanding what they're doing, and you just have to have enough power behind your letter to reach out and say, stop, and you're reaching out to their pocketbook and that really does get them. So it's really not a hard thing to do if, if you want to, um, to take those extra two steps. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, have any of you had to battle any, uh, any uh, legal um, any legal battles in court regarding your work, or um, is anything like, do you ever let anything slide just because it's just not worth fighting for because of the, the costs that, you know, that you can, like, that you have basically have to pay for? Do you, I mean, do you guys? He's asking uh, if any of you guys are jailbreak. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I've ever battled over was payment on a, a rather large bill, which happily I had kept incredible records on, and the client had sent me numerous emails telling me what a wonderful job we had done, and then suddenly when he got the bill it wasn't so good. But that's the only time I've ever had to. Yeah, I haven't and had any issues. Maybe the only issues I've had are before the contract was signed. But normally, once it's signed so far, not then what I haven't run into anything. I think that's a, a key thing is again, like if you've got everything laid out in that, that agreement with your client, then 
you can always refer back to that. And if you're running project management software like Basecamp or whatever else that, that archives, you know, the files and the, the message feeds and everything, then you can always refer to that as your basis to go back to. And I think, like Eric said, sometimes you just suck it up and make the changes or whatever right. the client needs and just get through it and then just don't work for that client anymore. The other thing, too, is, um, you know, in addition to getting a contract, don't, don't feel shy about asking for money up front, too. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times, a lot of times that separates the men from the boys, you know, people who, you know, you wonder, are they really serious about work, working on this? You know, if you ask for upfront money, all of a sudden, you know, That's oh. actually a good thing that you just brought up, like, the, the billing schedule of things. Being a freelancer or a small business, you, you can't do a whole project and bill it. And then do the next project and bill it. How do you keep? I mean, what what is a, a good rule of thumb to use as one of these things to keep your money continuous? I do a third, a third, a third, a third of the estimate when it's signed, a third halfway through, and a third when it's delivered. I have a unique approach to it, but it just it's more management. I do 25% down, and then I bill every 30 days for the work done. So and I'm I always do. getting paid as I do. The disadvantage to that is it takes more billing and accounting on my behalf, um, just because I have to really keep on top of sending out a bill every 30 days. And I, I'm, on, I'm on the other side of it. I actually will work on a retainer basis for this is how many hours your project is up to this many hours per month. And people just don't pass out, but I bill up front and you pay me before I start working, um, 100%. So, um, and maybe different for you guys, I'm consulting versus doing design work. And so we had a, a client that I'm working with. He goes, "Why? Why am I paying? Why are you sending me a bill for the first um, before the work's done?" And I was like, "That's the agreement you signed. We went over this. The, the deal is that." And politely, politely, no, I'm not being a jerk, but the deal is, I can, I I will be working for you, you know, this many hours per month. That's just how I set up my agreement. And and by the way, they do get a discount when they pay a little bit more of a discount because they pay me up front at the beginning of each month for the work that's going to be performed. But you also set aside those hours and yeah. don't sell them to anybody else. I don't. So, you know, that person's front first and I, in line. And I time track it. Um, and I'm right now I'm using Google Docs, but I'm probably going to start using fresh, um, fresh stuff. But in Google Docs, I did something crazy. I, I made a form that said, when did I start? And I leave it up and I put my project code in my notes. And I just leave that tab open and I go work. And if somebody in the family bothered me, I go I'm on the clock. I just put my hand up and go go away, and um, and I come back. And when I finish what I'm working on, even if I'm not complete, I'll put in the time that I'm done, and I hit save, and it goes into this nice, and they just accumulate in the spreadsheet. Uber low key, but at least it's on the web versus having to open up a spreadsheet in, in my computer, and it's always there when I go to close out. I know it's right there. So. You guys have coupons. <laughs> coupons. <laughs> My question would be more for Emily and Jill. Do you guys find it easier to build projects on an hourly basis or on a project for project basis? And if you do do it on a project for project basis, do you base that upon an estimated, an estimated hourly rate? Yeah, I build per project, um, and yes, I, I do base that off of an hourly rate, but I also base that off of past projects I've had like that. Um, in the past, maybe I did a project and I realized that took longer than I thought, so I know the next time that I estimate it, you know, send an estimate, it's a little bit up. I mean, in my contract, too, um, my final bill can vary, plus or minus 15%, but if it does get to the point that it goes over, I will notify them. And I do have a limit on number of revisions. When it goes above and beyond, we talk about it, and that's a change order. So I kind of set up those parameters. But I found the nice thing about billing per project is the client knows what to expect. I mean, there's a, a figure up front. And more often than not, that is what I bill in the end. I rarely have to change it. So. Pretty, much I, pretty much I do it like that. You know, you, you have a, you know, to get to this stage of design, it's going to cost this. And then including one round of revisions after that, we'll go on hourly. So, you know. Because, yeah, you know what, if you didn't, 
I've just been, if you don't, if you don't, with some people, if you don't cap their revisions, they'll, you'll yeah. just, you'll be revising it six months from now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really. Yeah, and it'll never get released. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, Kate? Yeah, sometimes in agreements where there's programming or things like that, and you don't have a flat fee arrangement, but, or, or any kind of, when you do have a flat fee or, or hourly, but it doesn't include number of revisions, I often put in something in, in all kinds of agreements that is a true change order provision. And it's a really important provision because these things always change. And what I do is if the is to put in a provision that says if the client wants some changes, you know, they can tell the designer and the designer will actually prepare a work, I often call it an impact statement or something, which actually shows how the whole project will be impacted. The amount of money, the timing, the schedule, what other third party material might be included in there, any kind of rights issues that are changed. And then they, they hand that to the client and the client has to sign off. Because it always so happens that you know you have this great agreement and then things change and you agree to it and they agree to it, but it's never quite put back into that agreement properly. So those are sort of nice ways to do it. That sounded really familiar because I was wondering where that came from. But like we got we did something like that for like Engine Works where it, it, it was almost similar where you get to a client that doesn't pay you on time now. So it's like what do you, you know, what do you just keep waiting? You, you have to put it in your agreement as well. Like, you know, we're going to bug you like every 15 days or so. And like, if, as you miss these payments past the deadline date, you're going to get tacked on another percentage each time. Like, it, 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 right. Yeah. And it, it, you want to you prove to your client that it is beneficial for them to stay on time, stay on top of things, and, and to work with you throughout the whole process so it gets done in a, in a timely manner. Yes. Do you guys use the AIGA contract? I don't. Is that, yeah. No, I actually I wrote my own. Okay. Any other questions out there? Well, sweet. I'd like to thank Mary Kate. <laughs>